So how's everybody doing today? Okay, good. So we're here for Dr. King Day 2019. We're at Second Baptist Church, uh, 441 uh, Monroe Street in Detroit, in Greek Town. I'm Michael M. Hotel, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. And I'm also broadcasting this presentation on my Facebook fan page, the African History Network, where we have one million followers all around the world. Um, so how many people listen to the African History Network show? Okay, we got a few listeners here. Okay, good, good. I'm on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. Uh, Sundays, uh, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you. I wasn't sure if I could move. That looked like, like really, really valuable right there, those pictures of Dr. King. So I wasn't sure if I was allowed to touch them or not. Okay, all right, cool. All right, so this presentation, you know, I, um, I do a, a two hour, about two, two and a half hour extended presentation on Dr. King's distorted legacy called The Distortion of the Legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the Revolutionary would not be televised on the television, okay? So that's an extended presentation. This is about a 25, 30 minute presentation. And um, I was working on it last night and uh, this morning as well, all right? So the name of this presentation is called Dr. King's Distorted Legacy, We're Coming to Get Our Check. Okay, that's the name of it, all right? And, and I got a video at the end that ties right into the beginning, all right? So first off, uh, I know I'm going to say some things that may be outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you never heard them before, disagree with them, or don't like them, does not mean that they are not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. All right? Now, uh, here are a few pictures, prominent, famous pictures of Dr. King, but some pictures people have never heard about or never seen about, okay? And unfortunately, Dr. King is one of our most revolutionary leaders, and he's one of our most distorted and most understood leaders also. Okay, unfortunately, a lot of what we know about Dr. King, uh, a lot of that is not true or has been grossly distorted by the white controlled media. All right, just so we understand, all right? Okay, so here we have Dr. King with uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. We have uh, Dr. King here. Who's this right here that Dr. King's with? Huh? Yeah, now that's not Photoshop. He met with Elijah Muhammad February 24, 1966. How many people knew that? Did we all talk that in school? No. The students over here, we all talk that in school, Dr. King met with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? No. I wonder why we did not talk that. See, there's a concerted effort to divide the African American community. And you have outsiders who come into our community and try to pick groups of oppressed people against one another. Okay? We have to stop that. See, Dr. King realized that that had to stop. And it continues today. We can't allow that to happen. See, this is why it was, this is why they want slaves on the plantation to learn to read and write. I'm one of the ones they would not want to learn to read and write. Because when you can understand the game that they're playing, you can beat them at their own game. Now here's this Dr. King with who? Malcolm X. Malcolm X. How many people, how many people did not know Dr. King met Malcolm X? When did they meet? They only met one time. They only met one time. Y'all know that, right? They only met one time. What day did they meet? March 26, 1964. They met the same month that, Dr. that Malcolm X officially separated from the nation of Islam. March 8, 1964 is when he officially separated from the nation of Islam. This is before the, uh, Malcolm gives his speech, uh, the Battle of the Bullet. He gave it twice, April 3rd, 1964 in Cleveland, Ohio. April 4th, 1964, where? Where did he give it April 4th, 1964? In Detroit. In Detroit. Detroit. Come on. Come on, people. Yeah. He gave it in Detroit. And then late in April, Malcolm goes on his hodge to Mount. Okay? Now, here's Dr. King with his wife, Coretta. Here's Dr. King, which is right here. Okay, we got to know Rosa Parks because white supremacists ran her out of uh, Montgomery, Alabama. She came to Detroit. It was, um, uh, John Conyers gave her a job in his office, Congressman John Conyers, okay? So Dr. King burst onto the scene with the Montgomery bus boycott. When did the Montgomery bus boycott start? It started December 5th, 1955, Montgomery, Alabama. It's supposed to be a one-day economic boycott that lasted 381 days. They had no idea it was going to last that long, okay? All right, this is just the introduction. This ain't even really the presentation. This is just the introduction. I'm just explaining pictures. 
All right, so uh, I'm the host of the African History Network show, 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation. We focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Okay, so if you want me to speak, I speak at churches. A lot of people are surprised. Can we find I speak at churches? Yeah, I speak at churches. They haven't run me over one yet. I speak at churches. All right, I speak at Kwanzaa events, African American History Month, schools, churches. I was a guest lecturer in the, in the Department of Africology at uh, Africology and African American Studies at Eastern Michigan University in October of 2018. Dr. Patrick Peel who uh, teaches the introductory to uh, Africology class here. He brought me in to speak to his class. So I'm looking at doing a, a master's degree in uh, Africology at Eastern Michigan University. So here's another one of our great leaders, Malcolm X. He said, if you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. All right. OK, so I already gave my disclaimer. I'm going to say some things that I probably already did say some things outside. This comes in your own awareness. Just because you've never heard it before does not mean they're not true. You just need to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. Now, three reasons why I get these, do these presentations. This is, putting together these presentations is a lot of work. And I was working on this, even though I've been doing the, the two-hour presentation then with Dr. King for about, uh, going back to 2015. This one here is specific for this event today. Three reasons why I do these presentations. I tell people, you don't have to believe a word that I say. Proper documentation ends all conversation. Go do your own research. One, to make you think. If I can make you think, you start asking questions. You start asking questions, you start seeking out answers. Two, to provide you with the information, the history, the resources, the books, the websites, the articles, the videos, et cetera, for you to go do your own research. Three, to bring about behavior modification, because right now it's correct your own behavior. The information we take in must influence and impact with our actions. Your thoughts create feelings, your feelings create actions and behaviors, your actions and behaviors create results. All right. And then Malcolm also taught us that media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and to make the guilty innocent, and that's power because they control the minds of the masses. In my degree as a business administration with a major in marketing, so I was trained in the program, and I know the program when I see it. All right. So, um, what do we know about Dr. King? How many books did Dr. King write? You can tell me. Anybody ever read any books Dr. King wrote? Well, that was written by Dr. King. That was written after he passed away. Anybody? Okay, so just to help you out, Dr. King wrote five books, okay? Dr. King wrote five books. His first book was called Stride Toward Freedom, uh, and it came out in 58, and that's uh, September 20th, 1958. That's when he was stabbed in a letter opener by a crazy uh, woman named Azola Ware. All right, this is his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos of Community, probably his most important book, written in 1967, his least, his, his worst selling book, but probably his most important book, all right? Chapter two is called Black Power, because Dr. King is talking about the Black Power Movement, and even though he had some disagreements with the Black Power Movement, he realized that he understood that that was the next step of the Civil Rights Movement, from the Civil, from the Civil Rights Movement to get the Black Power Movement, okay? I deal with that more in the extended presentation. But Dr. King wrote five books. We need to read Dr. King's books and stop listening to what other people tell us about Dr. King. All right? How many, y'all okay? Yeah. All right. How many people have seen the uh, documentary series Eyes on the Prize? Yes. Yeah. Anybody seen that? Okay. So I watch Eyes on the you know, I, I speak Dr. Um, African American History Month and doing uh, presentations every Saturday at Nandy's Knowledge Cafe, 71 Open Avenue, where everybody's invited in Highland Park, Michigan. But every Dr. King day, I get presentations. And uh, I watch Eyes of the Prize, you know, just to get into the mindset of what was going on back at that time as best I could, because I wasn't born in 71. And um, there's some serious problems with the documentary series Eyes of the Prize. It's pretty good, but one of the problems is they only dealt with Malcolm X for 90 seconds. That's in the last installment, Dylan, 1965. And that's not an analysis of Malcolm, that's just an excerpt of Malcolm speaking. They ain't talk about the Nation of Islam, they ain't deal with Malcolm X, they ain't talk about the Deacons for Defense of Justice. Found in July 10, 1964, in Jonesboro, Louisiana, by uh, Ernest Thomas and Frederick Douglass Kirkpatrick, which, and, and they were formed because they were not getting the proper protection from the sheriffs and the police and things 
like this to protect the civil rights workers. So these were African American men who armed themselves to protect the civil rights workers. And Dr. King would use them sometimes for his own personal protection. Yes. For his own personal protection. All right. And now we said make it plain. All right. Everybody all right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let the church say amen. amen. All right. So, okay. Okay. You know, you know, I, I don't I don't do presentations to offend anybody, but I do presentations to tell the truth. Okay, so we, we must understand that. Alright. Um so uh so eyes on the prize, right? They didn't deal with the Deacons for Defense and Justice, they didn't deal with Malcolm X, any of this. It's good as a start, but you have to realize there's some serious problems with the document. All right, so who's heard Dr. King's speech uh, that was renamed I Have a Dream? Because that wasn't the original name of the speech. Who's heard the speech? Okay, now did you hear the last two, three, or four minutes, or did you hear the full about 17 minutes of the speech? I know that. What did I can't hear? Because everybody's speaking at the same time. What was it? 17 minutes. Okay. Now, let me ask this question. Who's actually read the text of the speech? Who's actually read the text of the speech? Okay, we got one hand back here. Anybody else actually read the text of the speech? Okay. All right. Now all the millennials' hands should go up because they like text. So, so, so all the hands should go up, right? All right. Okay, that was a joke to break the monotony. <laughs> all right. So, um, it's important to read. When you study Dr. King. Uh, because he was such a good preacher, if you just listen to his speeches, you get caught up like in his prophet prophetic voice. You have to study Dr. King. You have to read his writings. You have to read the text of his speeches, okay? Now, here's Dr. King with this. Who is this? Now, how many people knew that Dr. King and Muhammad Ali, uh, Muhammad Ali were secretly friends? How many people knew? I talked about this on my radio show last night. A lot of people don't talk, talk about this. Now, they weren't supposed to be friends because he's a Christian. He's a nation of Islam. What are they doing together? But they had they have a lot in common. They were both both persecuted by the government. At their times, they were both probably the most recognizable African American men in the country. He's the heavyweight champion of the world. He's probably the civil rights leader. Okay? They both came out in opposition to the Vietnam War in the same month. Dr. King gave his first speech in opposition to the Vietnam War called Beyond Vietnam, April 4th, 1967. The next day, he was deemed the most hated man in America. He was banned from the White House by President Johnson. Okay? And then he was assassinated exactly one year to the date after he came out in opposition to the Vietnam War. Uh, April 28, 1967, that same month, that same year, Muhammad Ali refused to be drafted into the army. That's a conscientious objection in opposition to the Vietnam War. Alright? So these brothers had a lot, had a lot in common. Now, um, what was Dr. King really talking about in the speech? Because unfortunately, and I was a victim of this in school throughout the years, unfortunately, um, the main crux of the speech has been lost. And, the, and people like to focus on the last two, three, four minutes when he's talking about a dream. And, when, and, and the speech wasn't even about a dream. The speech was about holding America accountable for a promissory note they gave us 100 years prior in 1863 called the Emancipation Proclamation, which did not free the slaves. Y'all know that, right? Emancipation Proclamation did not free the slaves. Who's actually read it? There's a reason why they didn't want slaves to read. I'm trying to explain this to you all. When you read the Emancipation Proclamation, this is what happened. My mother called me, and she said, um, you ever read the Emancipation Proclamation? I said, yeah. She said, they have all these exceptions in here talking about slaves are free unless they're in these territories in these border states, and all this, I said, I told you the Emancipation Proclamation didn't free the slaves, January 1st, 1863. That was a military strategy that Abraham Lincoln used to rob the South of its slaves who were digging the ditches and cooking the food and, and uh, doing all types of jobs for the Confederacy. That was a military strategy. That didn't free the slaves. The goal of the Civil War wasn't to free the slaves. Y'all know this, right? The goal of what was the Civil War for? is to bring the South back into the Union, which was the economic engine of the Union. The Lincoln said, if he marched forth 1861 in Lincoln's inaugural address, Lincoln tried to assure the rest of the Southern states. And he, and he said, if he can 
Uh, he told him he had no, number one, no intention of freeing slaves in territories where slavery already existed. Okay? So we have to understand this because this is how these games keep being played with us. The information is right there. Go to loc.gov, which is the Library of Congress website. I know the government shutdown is going on right now, but the website's still up. You can go read. Okay? There was a reason why they didn't want slaves to learn to read and write. All right, so uh, very, very quickly here, let's analyze Dr. King's speech, right? I have a dream. Because uh, what we've been told that the speech is about ain't even what it was about. And if you read an article by Clarence B. Jones for Washington Post, January 16, 2011, called on Martin Luther King Day, remembering the first draft of I Have a Dream, who was Clarence B. Jones? Clarence B. Jones was one of Dr. King's speech writers. He'll tell you the phrase, I have a dream, wasn't even in the original draft of the speech, because the speech wasn't about a dream. We've been lied to, you've been had, you've been hoodwinked, you've been bamboozled, led astray, run them up, you've been shysted. All right, so let's look at this. Understanding the I Have a Dream speech, August 28, 1963. In the original draft of the speech, the phrase I Have a Dream did not appear. I Have a Dream wasn't even the original name of the speech. The first draft was called Normal, Normalcy, Never Again. And then also the speech was called A Council Chat. And when I explain the speech to you, you're going to find out what I was called A Council Chat. The foundation of the speech was the idea of African Americans marching in Washington, D.C. to redeem a promissory note or check for justice. And, and the promissory note was an analogy, because we know preachers use analogies and metaphors and parables, right? I can't even get a right on that. Y'all right. 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 okay? Right. All right. You'll mesmerize my, 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 my prophetic, prophetic voice. All right. So Dr. King was the last speaker scheduled to speak that day. Nobody wanted to go last, right? Because they were afraid, one, that a lot of people would leave by the end. And also, they were afraid that, you know, the news cameras, they had to get the news reels back to the news station at a certain time to run that on the evening news. They only had three stations back then, okay? So they were afraid nobody wanted to go last. So he was scheduled to speak only four and a half minutes. He spoke for about 17 minutes, most of it extemporaneously, just, just like preachers do, you know, three times a month, right? But it's all right, I'm just saying, that's what happened. So read this, check out this article on Martin Luther King Day, remembering remembering the first draft of I Have a Dream by Clarence B. Jones, Washington Post, January 16, 2011. There is some good information out there. You just got to know where to look for it. All right? So, at one point, the speech was called a council check. The speech was actually an amalgam of several of Dr. King's previous talks and sermons, including Unfulfilled Hopes in 1959, which is a speech he gave, and the American Dream in 1961 and 62. Uh, uh, read this now. This is an article from SmithsonianMag.com. SmithsonianMag.com is the official website of the Smithsonian Institute. Screen. I have a dream. It may be difficult to view the entire 17-minute speech online, but two films were made about the March on Washington that highlight that momentous day. It came out August 26, 2011. Read that article. Get more information, more background information. The speech wasn't about a dream, people. I'm trying to explain it to you. This is the same thing they done with his last speech, April 3rd, 1968, I've been to the mountaintop. When he talks about economic empowerment, he talks about supporting black institutions, he talks about boycotting Coca-Cola, Wonder Bread, Hearts Bread, and still test milk because of the discriminatory, discriminatory hiring practices in Memphis, Tennessee. He talks about, um, he, he, he says that the uh, uh, Negro has an annual income of $30 billion, and that's a lot of money if you know how to pull it. He's talking about economics in that speech. But that's totally missed. We're missed we're, 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 our attention is redirected to the last part of the speech when he talks about getting to the mountaintop and we as a people to get to the promised land. I may not get there with you, but we as a people to get to the promised land. All that other meat, the text of the speech, a blueprint that he left, he talks about redistributing the pain through targeted, sustained economic withdrawal strategies. He talks about we have to always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal. He's telling you, when you got mass protests, you have to have targeted, sustained economic withdrawal strategies to punish and hurt your enemy. Yeah. He's explaining, he's leaving a blueprint. We miss all of that. Let's speak about 43 minutes. We miss all of that and focus on the two minutes that keep showing us on the television. The television is a vision to tell lies. The television, I'm not going to tell you about the media. I'm trying to explain it to you. Everybody okay? We all on the same page now? 
All right. Five, so this is the beginning of the speech. I, I, I just picked out some segments here. Just to, 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 now, that, now that we understand, right, that we didn't understand, I just picked out some segments so that we can better understand. Five score, five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon uh, light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. So if, it's, if you read the speech, if there's any question, because a lot of people say, well, Dr. King was fighting for everybody. Yeah, that's true, but at the core, he was fighting for black people. Yeah. All you got to do is read his speeches. Yeah. What slaves is he talking about? What Negroes is he talking about? This, I mean, all you have to do is read it. There's a reason why I ain't no slaves to read. I'm trying to explain this to you. All right, but 100 years ago, later, the Negro skipped so, uh, he, so he's going back to 19, he's going back to 1863, and he's fast forwarded to 1963 when the March on Washington takes place. The March on Washington for jobs and justice. Okay, okay, or a uh, uh, freedom to job, freedom of jobs. Okay, 100 years later. The life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination, okay? 100 years later, the Negro lives, a lonely, lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. And so we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. Now, when you actually study the speech, you find out, once you get back past all the niceties, you find out he's talking about this man of white supremacy and racism. Yes. And this is a constant theme in a lot of the speeches. Okay? And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. Yes. How many people knew that Dr. King spoke out about police brutality in this speech? We ain't, we, we're not taught that in school. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy, the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. He's, probably, he's, he's addressing the economic conditions and the conditions of African Americans at that time coming from white supremacy and racism. He's talking about Jim Crow segregation. Yes. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity, dignity by signs stating for white only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and the Negro in New York believes he has nothing to wish to vote. He's talking about voter suppression. He's talking like, like voter suppression taking place right now. Yeah. Taking place right now. Yes. He said, go back to Mr. So when he wanted, one of the things when you, when you research this, they wanted, and Clarence B. Jones talks about this, they wanted a call to action in the speech, okay? So Dr. King assures them that everything's going to be all right. We're going to keep persevering, and everything's going to be all right. He said, go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to South Carolina. Go back to Georgia, go back to Louisiana, go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. So you can read this, you can read the text of the speech at Stanford University's King Institute. They have a, they have a Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute at Stanford University's website. How many people knew that? Okay, this is a free resource for y'all, okay? I have to check this out. They have the full text of the speech there. I have a dream address delivered at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Kinginstitute.stanford.edu, all right? Let's continue. Who knows who this is? Everybody was speaking at the same time. Man, Team Stephen Biko. I should have had Denzel Washington up here. You wouldn't know that, because Denzel Washington played Man, Team Stephen Biko in the 1987 movie, Cry Free. Bantu Stephen Beagle was one of our great South African freedom fighters, right? And he said the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. The most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressor, which means we must take our minds back. 
So this is the famous picture. And there are a few pictures of this. They only met one time. Dr. King and Malcolm X, March 26, 1964. How many people knew that Malcolm was calling for unification of the civil rights leaders and their followers? How many, how many people knew this? This was after he left the nation. This was why he was in the nation of Islam. Did y'all know that? July 31st, 1963, Malcolm sends a letter to Dr. King requesting a meeting with Dr. King, and, Dr. and Malcolm is calling for a unification of the civil rights leaders. He said that uh, uh, John F. Kennedy could meet, could meet with Nikita Khrushchev, who was the prime minister, the leader of Russia. He said if they can set aside their major differences, then he said Negro leaders should be able to set aside our minor differences, and he was calling for us to come together to, uh, for a united front against racial oppression in this country. He said that we have to find a common solution to a common problem posed by a common enemy. This is Malcolm. Why he's in the nation of Islam? He didn't leave the nation of Islam until March 8, 1964. How many people were taught this in school that Malcolm was calling for a unification of the civil rights leaders while he's still in the nation? July 31, 1964. We need to read this article here. Martin Luther King Jr. met Malcolm X just once. The photo still haunts us with what was lost. It breaks all this stuff down. After Malcolm's assassinated, it, see, Malcolm and Dr. King did not hate each other, contrary to what people want you to think. Malcolm and Dr. King, there was mutual admiration. There was disagreement on some tactics. But eventually, they wanted to get to the same destination. But they both admired one another. In the after, so after um, Malcolm is assassinated, February 21st, 1965, um, Dr. King writes, a column about Malcolm after the assassination in the Amsterdam News, the African American newspaper. In his Amsterdam News column, Dr. King mourned uh, Malcolm. He said, quote, like, like the murder of Congo Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba, and uh, I think it was December 17th, we just commemorated the assassination of Patrice Lumumba, uh, which was uh, engineered by the CIA, okay? We need to research Patrice Lumumba, Prime Minister of uh, Congo. Um, the murder of Malcolm X derived, deprives the world of a potentially great leader. I could not agree with either of those men, but I could see in them a capacity for leadership which I could respect. This is, this is Dr. King writing about Malcolm. And Dr. King knew he was going to be assassinated also. Dr. King knew he was going to be killed. All right? Keep in mind, Malcolm was four years older than Dr. King, but they were both assassinated when they were 39 years old. All right? Now, in the telegram to uh, Malcolm X's widow, Betty Shabazz, Dr. King wrote, quote, while we do not always see eye to eye on methods to solve the race problem, I always had a deep affection for Malcolm and felt that he had a great ability to put his fingers on the existence and root of the problem, end quote. When you, when you read this article from Denise L. Brown for Washington Post, she talks about in here, um, Let's see, where is it? Okay, so Malcolm's calling for a, uh, a unification of the civil rights leaders also. And um, let me see. So yeah, Malcolm's calling for a united front. Uh, Malcolm says, the present racial crisis in the country carries within it powerful destructive ingredients that may soon erupt into an uncontrollable explosion. The seriousness of this situation demands that immediate steps must be taken to solve this crucial problem by those who have genuine concern before the racial power keg explodes. A united front involving all Negro factions, elements, and their leaders is absolutely necessary. Okay? So, Malcolm, when he meets Dr. King, they only met for a couple minutes here. This is the only time they met. Malcolm tells Dr. King, that he said, quote, I'm throwing myself into the heart of the civil rights struggle, end quote. How many people knew this? Because when you, when you read the text of Malcolm's speech, the Battle of the Bullet, April 3rd, 1964, and Cleveland, April 4th, 1964, here in Detroit, he talks about joining the civil rights movement and injecting black nationalism into the civil rights movement. How many people knew this? See, Malcolm and Dr. King were more alike than we think. We need to study it. All right. So this is uh, Dr. King. So the year after Malcolm, uh, so first of all, when Malcolm sends a letter to Dr. King requesting a meeting, uh, Dr. King does not meet with Malcolm, okay? I'm not even sure if he got a response back, but he did not meet with Malcolm. The next month, we had the March on Washington. 
Malcolm goes to the Marshall in Washington, and he derides it. He calls it the farce in Washington. But when Malcolm leaves the nation, right, Malcolm, you, 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 you have to study Malcolm after he leaves the nation, because toward the end of both of their lives, their ideologies are converged. Dr. King and Malcolm are sounding alike. So they met February 24, 1966. We're not even told that, OK? And if you go back to 1958, the Nation of Islam was asking Dr. King to come speak to the, uh, the nation in Chicago. In 1958, Dr. King declined. But you have, behind the scenes, these leaders reaching out to one another. But we're not, we're not told about that. So this is a book that everybody needs to read. Martin Malcolm in America, a dream or a nightmare. Martin Malcolm in America, a dream or a nightmare. We're talking about Dr. King being a polar opposite of Malcolm, but we aren't taught that toward the end of both of their lives, the ideologies were converging. They were both influenced by Marcus Garvey also. That's not even the stuff. They were both influenced by Marcus Garvey. All right? And uh, lastly, I'm going to wrap up with this here. This is a two minute clip that everybody wants to see, right? In 1968, Dr. King was speaking at a church in Mississippi. And he made land and compensation front and center in his, uh, in his speech, okay? And he said, uh, at the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white cousins from Europe with an economic floor, but not only did they get the land, they built land grant colleges to teach them how to farm. So what he's dealing with, what he's talking about, and I'll put this clip proof here, what he's talking about is the Homestead Act of 1862, the Southern Homestead Act of 1866. 1862 was during the Civil War. That's the second year of the Civil War. The Dawes Allotment Act of 1887, over, over 400 million acres of land were given away to white people in this country, as well as white immigrants coming to this country, and African people who worked the land for free for 246 years were largely locked out of that land giveaway. This is what he's talking about. Let's listen to uh, Brother uh, Dr. King here. Let's start this up and uh, put the mic up to it. At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land. Can y'all hear? Mm -hmm. That's why this is titled, We're Coming to Get Our Check. This is Dr. King. And how many people have never seen that before? Okay, there's a reason why you've never seen that before. This is during the Poor People's Campaign. And one of the things he was fighting for during the Poor People's Campaign was a guaranteed income for poor people, a guaranteed monthly income for poor people. But he was also, at that ties right into African Americans not getting any compensation after slavery ended. What does that sound like he's talking about? Don't be scared. What does it sound like you're talking about? Correct. Come on, people. We can be black in here. It's all right. <laughs> okay, so we got to understand this. So we have to really study Dr. King, study his teaching, because a lot of what we've been talking about Dr. King is absolutely not true. So I'm going to wrap it up here. I'll be downstairs also if you want to ask some questions. I have my DVD lectures down there. I have the full 12 presentation on Dr. King, some of my other lectures as well.